Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Toby Talks, where I talk to people that are achieving extraordinary things in the world of sport, work, or in their personal lives. Uh, today I'm talking to Sky Sports News presenter, Michelle Owen. Michelle, welcome along. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you're keeping well under the, the current restrictions. I guess it's a, a bit of a bittersweet time for you because it means you get to spend a bit more time with your new baby boy, Zach. Yeah, well, I was meant to come back to Soccer Saturday the weekend that football stopped. So, when well, middle of March, like, that was my first game back, and they stopped it on the Friday after Mikel Arteta had that positive test. So, I was like, okay. And then, obviously, it was stopped on the 3rd of April. So, you're thinking, okay, maybe 3rd of April. And obviously, it's just gone on and on. So, it was completely and mentally like, ready to come back just like a couple of days a week to do games. So, it's been. It's been a bit weird because I thought I'd be full on back working now and I was due to go to the Euros like next week and things. So, um, yeah, it's been a bit like, oh, OK, this is happening. Well, you just sort of plod along each day, don't you? And yeah, get to spend more time, more time with Zach. I was really fortunate that I was only going to be out of the house for like a day and a half a week anyway. So um, I, I was ready for like a little bit of football time. But it's been nice to have an extra time with Zach. I think. My husband's still been been working a fair bit so um just mummy and zach time really not seeing anyone else it's just he thinks me and his dad are the only people that exist now so um <laughs> poor boy. but yeah like everyone it's, it's been fine you know we're very lucky we've got a little garden and things so we're doing a lot worse nice i didn't realize you were meant to be going to the euro what was your um plan yeah. for, for 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 doing that were you based it here in in the uk or was it going to be around europe no so um zach and my husband were coming with me so we were going to baku and row with the Welsh squad. So I was going to be the Wales reporter for ITV Sport. Oh, wow. Um, but yeah, so all being well, you know, touch wood, if we get it back on next year, I'll be going next year. Um, but yeah, we had all booked up, all the flights were booked, everything was set to go. We've got Zach's little passport, and they were obviously going to be based at the hotel while I was working. And yeah, ITV were great and said, you know, you can bring them, no problem. So it was really, really exciting and we were really excited about it. And then it soon became clear the Euros were off and it wasn't again. Like they've said, they'll be played next year, even though they're calling it, well, they're still branding, aren't they? Euro 2020, even though yeah. it's going to be in 2020. Yeah. So that's going to be weird. Um, but hopefully we get to go next year, and but we'll wait and see what happens. Well, from an atmosphere perspective, I feel like next summer will be built up even more so than it was this year. And it will be even more of an occasion that we could have ever imagined and for you I mean your pregnancy wasn't exactly straightforward either you were pretty unwell throughout that period so I'm assuming this time at home you're almost grateful for the simple things just being comfortable and able to to sit sit around and chill and relax at, you know at different stages yeah literally like it was, it's funny because lockdown started pretty much when I started being really ill last year so like I had HD in my pregnancy which like a very very small number of pregnant women get so not a lot is known about it and people say oh that's what Kate Middleton had but you know I do think she had it but um, a lot of women have it quite a lot more severely so until like 19 20 weeks pregnant I was being sick every day sometimes like 20 30 times a day and was in and out of hospital so last spring I just spent laying in, in the bedroom so this sort of this lockdown this spring has been like nowhere near as bad and I sort of, it gives you a bit of a sense of perspective, I guess. Like it's not, it's been horrible and we can't see my family because my family are in Wales and obviously they've got different rules to us now. When we could have seen them next week, we still can't see them. And that's difficult, you know, Zach not seeing his grandparents and things. But compared to where we were this time last year, you know, it's so, so different. And it's just been funny, like we've spent this spring as well, not seeing on anyone either. Um, but hopefully, you know, all being well, if football does get back up and running, I'll actually get to see the, the conclusion of the season this year, which will be which will be nice. Where did your love for it start? Particularly football that seems to be, you know, your favourite sport. Where, was it an interest of yours growing up? I know you played football to a high level as well, but where did that originate from? Was it a family influence? Uh, no, no, not at all. My family don't like football. Like, they don't watch it, they don't play it. And I don't know, I, I honestly don't know why I loved it, but I started collecting, you know, all the stickers when I was really young, like about four. I had a little desk that I used to stick all the stickers on and I liked the football ones. And I just always thought football was, I guess, interesting. And I remember sort of collecting all these stickers and thinking I'd like to have a go at that. And I must've got a football from somewhere. And then I sort of said to my parents, I really want to join a team. And they were like, what? 
because uh, at that time a girl playing football was, was really unusual so I was the only girl there with all these boys and they said oh we'll get you some boots if you go for a couple of weeks so I was slipping around in my little trainers for ages and they said okay I'll get you some boots and I didn't stop playing you know, you know played really until I was pregnant so um played all my life and just like everyone loves football just loved it more and more unfortunately my parents didn't particularly like football so I never had Sky Sports or anything growing up but when we were growing up you know we had the Champions League on terrestrial TV and and things like that so I didn't, didn't miss out too much and I used to watch Match of the Day or do you remember it was ITV what was it called I can't remember what the show was called with Des Lynham yeah I, no I can't I remember I remember it was something but I remember like the YouTube so like the rest of my family were watching a film like in the lounge and then when I was finally around allowed a bedroom and a TV in my bedroom, sorry, I'm so sleep deprived. When I was, uh, my little boy, uh, when I was finally allowed a, a TV in my bedroom, and I used to watch that. But before that, I listened to football all the time. I had a little black radio on my windowsill, and I'd listen to Radio 5, like every every commentary there was, like on my own in my bedroom. So I've just always been obsessed with it, really, and it's never stopped. And do you think the fact that when you were growing up, there was, you know, less female football players meant that you were then determined to make a career in that industry as well? Did you then go on and study, say, sports journalism at university? What path did you take? Um, I remember when I was growing up, you're right, like female football is a lot more accessible now. It's obviously got a long way to go still. And there used to be like one female magazine, which was like She Kicks. And I played for um, Shrewsbury Town. They had their academies now, but they used to call them like a centre of excellence. And I think we used to get a free copy each term. I used to literally read it page to page like a thousand times because it was the only women's football you sort of saw or got your hands on because it makes me sound old, but we didn't, you know, internet wasn't really a big thing until like I was in my teens and things like that weren't readily accessible like they are today. So when I was a teenager, you know, I, I definitely knew I wanted to go into some sort of broadcasting. And originally I, I thought, oh, I might want to do news. And when I was in university, I did a lot of work experience at various places. I did a placement at Sky News and ITV, and I worked for ITV News for, in Wales for a little while as well, just sort of on their news desk. But for me personally, I, I struggled with news because I struggled to take like the personal aspect out of it. Like, you know, we, we talk about, it's awful, we talk about a horrible story, something tragic that happened, and because you have to take that personal element away from it, you know, after a while you find yourself doing it. And I was like, well, actually, I don't want to do this. And, you know, all the politics and things like that. I was like, no, this, this, this isn't for me. Sport is for me. But at the same time, I was getting into radio and doing a lot of, of radio presenting. And when I was doing that, I was also doing uh, sports writing for the student newspaper. So I was getting together all this experience. And it was all leading to sort of radio at the time. So I started off in radio, radio presenting, and did various shows in various places when I finished university. So I was meant to go to Cardiff School of Journalism to do their, their postgrad, but I dropped out the week before because I got a job in radio. So, you know, it was, it was actually a part-time job. So I was doing that. And then my evenings, I was reading travel news. So... I was doing both of those, but at this radio station, I had a chance to present the sports show, so I got into that, and they used to let me go to Cardiff and Swansea Games in South Wales, because they were a South Wales station, so I just started recording presses, uh, post, post-match post presses, I started recording like reports to sum up the game at the end of it, and after a few years, like I had obviously a little, little one of them, because I was with that group of stations for a few years, and then I started doing breakfast at another radio station. And, and when I was there, like I had more free time. So like we'd finish, we'd leave the office at half 11 a day. And uh, so I, I compiled all these and just kept asking um, the, the contacts I had at Sky from before when I'd been working experience. You know what it's like, everyone knows everyone. So you managed yeah. To, yeah. to narrow it down. And um, yeah, I got, I got in touch with the right people. And in the end, they're like, yeah, okay, like, we'll give you a go next season. And I think that was like six, seven years ago. And I started out doing the ICM reports and they were like, after like a season, they were like, oh, do you, do you fancy having to go in vision? I was like, oh, I don't know. Because my whole career had been tailored towards going towards radio, you know? And I'd never done TV, apart from working in newsrooms behind the scenes, you know, I'd never done anything in front of a camera. And I think that's what radio is so good at. It sort of sets you up really to make that, transition 
and yeah that's it went from there really and everything is just everything went quite quickly from there and here I am there must have been a moment somewhere along the way you were like this is this is it now I've, this is this is cool I'm here I'm presenting Sky Sports yeah, News right. earlier perhaps than that well, so I started doing soccer Saturday and Visions like maybe five, six years ago. And when I was doing that, Sky Sports News kept wanting to talk to me. And they were like, you know, what are you doing? Do you want to do more stuff for us? I was like, oh, no, I'm under contract at a radio station. And they're like, oh, okay, like, we, we would like you to do more for us. But I was quite happy, like, doing the radio and doing games on Saturday. You know, it was, it was, it was nice. I was enjoying it. And I was even working Sundays at that point as well, doing my other radio show. So I was doing seven days a week and then I dropped down to six. And then because this radio show that I was doing was drive time was in the afternoon, I, I started doing bits in the morning for Sky Sports News and they gradually just wanted more and more. And it got to the point there was a crossover. I was like, okay, well, I need to choose now because I was starting to need time off my radio show to go and do games and, and do other things. So I left there and, and pursued sport fully. Um, and then they, they said, oh, maybe you have a go at like, you know, presenting some sport bulletins on Sky News and I mean you know it took like nine ten months of practicing before I actually did one and then I did that probably for like seven or eight months and then a couple of years ago they said okay like we'll try on Sky Sports News and it is the most surreal thing like going down and sitting next to Jim White and and presenting you know four to eight on Sky Sports News like their prime time slot but I, I was like, I was really nervous the first time. My first one actually was a Sunday morning with Adam Leventhal, who's like the nicest guy. But I felt fine because I'd done Soccer Saturday for so long, you know. My first Soccer Saturday game, I was so nervous in vision. It was uh, Yeovil Town, and this is terrible, but I can't even remember who they're playing. But Yeovil Town were playing at home. And uh, it was October, it was the international break. So they were trying me like on a quieter weekend, you know. And I just remember thinking, like, just do it like an ISDM report. Because when I did ISDM reports, all I ever did was write down the scorer and the assist. So, and to start with, like, I was obsessed if I have to look at the camera the whole time. But of course you don't. Like, of course you don't. You know, it's fine to glance down. I mean, look at Cammy. So, uh, obviously, as you get more comfortable. And I'm sure if I found that report now, I'd be like, oh, that was terrible. But there's never been a moment where I've been like, oh, wow, this is it. I just, I all, because I'm never, I'm never satisfied. So I'm like, okay, that's done, what's next? Which in some ways is a good thing and in some ways is a bad thing, I guess. So, but I, I absolutely love what I do and I hope that in time we can get back to it because we had it all planned out, of course, like everyone does and how it's gonna work with childcare and my husband working. So I really hope that soon, you know, we'll, we'll get back to that and we'll see what's next. And I assume when you become a Sky Sports News presenter, and like you say, you presented a number of, you know, soccer Saturday shifts from various grounds around the Southwest. You always take comfort from the fact that you're already a recognised face, probably on the screen, that if you went flying straight into the Sky Sports News presenting shifts, might be a little bit more like rabbit in the headlights at that point. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, like, if they do, but I wouldn't imagine that anyone, well maybe they do, anyone goes straight onto Sky Sports News, you usually start off on the bulletins on Sky News, not because they're any lesser of significance or importance, you know, loads of people, I would think as many people watch Sky News as they do Sky Sports News, maybe even more, but because they're shorter, so like when you do a shift on there, there's various bulletins, the longest is half an hour, but it's split into two, so you sort of build your way up there anyway, and I think it was like nice for me that some people sort of thought oh, okay she knows about football so she knows a bit about sport it wasn't like she was just thrust on there out of nowhere like you say so that was definitely nice that people might have recognized me from that yeah for sure and does a lot of preparation go yeah. into a, a presenting shift on sky sports news are you having to to do work in the lead up to it or is it i mean i know it's sort of rolling news i'd imagine so there's a lot of repeating the same sort of stories um but yeah. do you do a lot of preparation in the, in the lead up to those yeah, sure. So say you're doing like a Sunday, three to eight, which is like a mammoth shift, and it's Super <laughs> Sunday, you've got probably two games in, in that time, and then there might be a random championship one, and there'll probably be a Scottish League one as well, and you, you have to prep for all those games, because no one can tell you what's going to happen. So you have all the teams, and because you break the team news yourself, you have to know all the teams from the last week, and you have to work out yourself, you know, just as you do when you're at a game, what the changes are. 
and I think it's really important there where your knowledge of, of football can come in because you know what it's like in the championship or like with respect to the Scottish leagues there's some players you haven't heard of and their names might be unusual mm -hmm. so when you know how to say them you're like oh yeah I know that because I did him like three weeks ago on a Tuesday night in the cold so that's that's nice so you have to prep all that but then you know if, it, if it's summer there'll be tennis going on and if you're not you know that knowledgeable on tennis you could brush up on your tennis and if there's golf you know I guess if you don't play golf golf could kind of be like double dutch but like because I I started playing when I started presenting on Sky Sports News because I was like mm, I want to find out more about this so I'll just go and play to see what it's like um and I played and saw how difficult it is I still play terribly but like you know, but you know you know what things mean. Then you know what an eagle or birdie is. You you know yeah. if if you're playing a shot, you can sort of ad lib over how good that shot is. You know you can you don't have a script the whole time, so you do need to say. So yeah, you have four, four, three football matches going on. You have a tennis match. You have a two golf tournaments. Maybe three golf tournaments if there's a women's one as well going on at the same time. And an F1 race. You know that's happened before. And then there might be some breaking news that someone's out for the season or, you know, awfully maybe someone's died, like they're, they're the horrible ones, of course. So, yeah, I think people don't realise. I think pe some people might think that you sit down and read an auto for five hours, but that's like, that's not it at all. Um, and yeah, my colleagues are, are super talented. And the viewers as well, I'd imagine, are unrelenting. I mean, if you were to, this is the thing, if you were to make, you want to be able to put preparation in and make sure you know your stuff. Because if you were to make a mistake, you soon realise the, the the level of audience that Sky Sports has when I'm sure it's picked up on Twitter, Facebook straight away. Or, you know, a, a fan of a particular club isn't happy with the way you pronounce one of the player names. People are on it like a rash and they don't, you know, let you forget it either, I'd imagine. Yeah, that's the thing with social media, isn't it? Like your contacts will and tangible at, at any time. So, yeah, I, I don't think you really think about that when you're on air. But like, you know, you're allowed to phone and you're allowed to, to go on the internet. So if someone does say something, you do see it, and you're just like, mm, great. Um, like when I do games for Soccer Saturday, I don't I, during like the game, I don't go on my phone unless there's some sort of discrepancy. So like, you know, Ashton Gate, like you're up in the box. Like I I text like um, Gregor from the Bristol Co Bristol Live before. I can't speak to him and been like, who are they, you know, I've just said this on Soccer Saturday, but my producers come back and said this person scored, you know, uh, what are Opta saying? So we sat next to the guy who's doing Opta. Yeah. So I don't really yeah. go on my phone apart from for things like that during live games, but when you're presenting, it's a bit different. Um, but as with everything, you know, you see the bad ones and they stick in your head and you're just like, oh, <laughs> well, thanks for that. But I've, I've been quite lucky. Touch wood, I haven't had too much. When I was pregnant, people were, like telling me that I look fat, which is great. So, um, well, I was just, I was just <laughs> that. So, I mean, to this day, you still met with a lot of negativity when you are presenting. I mean, I've seen a couple of times that you've obviously screenshotted what somebody has said on Twitter, for example, and called them out for making a, well, thinking it's their business to make a, you know, a, a comment about your appearance. Do you still get that a lot now, and people are still, you know, relentless with it? people haven't seen me for a few months so it's fine no, but, um, hopefully when I go back they won't call me fat anymore but you know like that's like so irrelevant like your size like what you look like shouldn't matter it's like what comes out of your mouth that matters you know and so what if I looked look different or you know to be honest when you've had a baby it is seriously hard to lose weight so whatever I come back looking like I would hope that people wouldn't be too critical but it is something you're really aware of because it's, it's the generation we live in. We live in the Instagram generation. Like, I sometimes put my Instagram post, you know, like, this is not like how it always is. You know, Zach is not always smiling. I am not always smiling. As you can see, I look pretty tired. Um, but yeah, people think it's just their business, you know. Like, I, that, I was quite upset about one. I think it was the last Saturday I did. And he's like, oh, no offence, but you've put a lot of weight on. And I'm like, okay so no offense makes that okay does it like because you've said that first like i don't understand who in their right mind would be sitting at home and thinks it's okay like to get their phone out or get their laptop out and literally directly tell you you look rubbish like honestly like i would never do it i, I just i would never do it because i think it's so rude and also people forget like it's someone's you know like how would they feel if it was their mum or their sister or their daughter or whatever or their best friend um and people say, oh, you know, don't feed the trolls. And to be fair, like, 
myself, Bianca, who's on Soccer Saturday as well, get like quite a bit of stuff. And most of it, you do like just turn the other cheek to. But sometimes if they get you in a bad moment or a bad mood, you do want to call them out. This is not acceptable. So why should I have to read this and you get away with, with sending it to me? So it's not, it's not nice, but... Yeah, social media is, is good and bad. I absolutely think everyone should be able to have opinions and, and air them freely. And I think, you know, some people take that a little bit further than others, put it that way. Yeah, I think the, the yeah, thing I that know. I the thing that, the, that that I struggle to compute is just how it's one thing even thinking, you know, you know, even passing judgment sat in your living room about somebody's appearance, but then to even I just don't understand the the, the thought process of even then picking up your phone, like you say and typing it all out yeah. and at no point does that not come into your your mind that you are upsetting somebody i just can't i just i don't know i just and it's there to it's there forever then as well there's no getting rid of that comment you're putting yeah. it out there for everybody to see it will come back to bite you inevitably as well if you're then going for a job in future yeah it's mad. but like, it's, been, it's been really quite interesting that like a lot of people who are like you and I, with everything that's happened over sort of lockdown and things, like if you had an opinion over something, and even if you've not been strong on it, but you've like maybe made, I don't know, a sarcastic joke or something like that, like I've done that, uh, just as every sort of normal person might, might do. And people hate it. Like mm. pe some people, they do not like you having an opinion because like they think you're this sports reporter, you're this broadcaster, you shouldn't have an opinion. People are like, oh, stick to football or, um, you know, tweet about football, don't want to hear about this. I'm like, well, I'm following you then because it's my account. So, yeah, <laughs> each to their own, but it's not great, is it? Yeah. Have you had any advice along the way, whether it's to do with dealing with that side of things, all the all the presenting that has stuck with you, that has sort of helped you on your journey to, to now presenting on Sky Sports News? Oh, well, yeah, lots of people have said lots of things over the years. I think the most important thing is just really be yourself because, you know, I think you can see other people broadcasting and someone might want to be like the next Jim White or whatever. And Jim's amazing and take nothing away from him. But, you know, you should always try and sort of be yourself. And there was one person who was quite high up somewhere I worked who was like, oh, you know, you need to like watch this presenter on Canadian TV. You need to be more like her and you need to sort of shout more and project more and be more over the top. And I was like, yeah, but that's, like I tried it one shift. I was like, this just is not me at all. Um, and that's just sort of what I've always gone by. And obviously just do your preparation. If I think if you do your preparation, you know, that's probably what I'll find one of the hardest things when if when we, we get to go back to Soccer Saturday is find, you know, being disciplined. It was easy before to find the time. So now to find that time, you know, even when you're sort of shattered an evening to go and do that preparation or at least have have some preparation ready to look at if, <laughs> if you can't remember it so yeah just be yourself and, and preparation really and lots of work experience as well you know i i did as much work experience as i literally physically could over the time i was a student and i think it's really really important and a very broad topic but football has a far larger portion of, of men that are working in the industry both in television it would appear and you know on the pitch as well and I don't want to come across assumptive by any means, but sadly, my guess is um, that given how involved you are in football, whilst people always don't necessarily consciously discriminate against you because you're female, I'm guessing that is probably something you have encountered over the years on your way to, to working for Sky Sports. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's funny, like when I first stepped in the press box anywhere, like I didn't know anyone and I found it quite hard, but no one spoke to me. And sort of it might you know maybe they didn't speak to anyone because anyone that was new it didn't matter if I was a, a woman or a man but you did feel like maybe you got a few more looks and I definitely feel like I had to earn my place um but you know I, I can't say that that is definitely based on gender it might be for anyone new that works walks into a press box because you know what it's like everyone knows everyone they're funny but places now, it is weird isn't it but now like I feel so at home and I feel so relaxed but like actually like when I go back after Zach if I go to Grand to have been to for a while like it is going to feel weird and I hope familiar faces are there but I remember like one time years ago like when I was first doing my SDM reports this guy was like oh what would you he like sat next to me and he was from community radio he was like oh what would you say though like if I told you to get back in the kitchen 
I said, what do you mean? He's like, oh, no, no, I mean, like, do you get that a lot? And I'm like, well, no, like, why are you asking me that? And like the whole game went by and I didn't do a report because there was no goals until the 87th minute. And then I did one. And like, I literally did it like side eye, side eyeing him, <laughs> like just to prove like, you know, I belong here too. Like, stop asking me these, these questions. And whether I misunderstood it or what, I, I don't know. But that one stuck with me. And, you know, I've been told to get my tits out a few times by, a few times by fans. So I'm just like, like, what do you say back to that? Like, if yeah. I said something in a front yeah. back, they probably film it and have a field day with it. So sometimes you feel a bit cornered and snooted. But I got to say, in the main, it's it's fine. You know, you you do get stuff on social media, and yeah, the get back in the kitchen one is used quite a lot. Um, I know, like Jackie Oakley springs to mind. She gets it all the time as well. You know, and she's like one of the most trailblazers, really, for for women in in sport broadcasting. So. Yeah, it still happens, but in the main, face to face, people are lovely, and there's more and more women now, to be honest. You've got a favourite press box you visited around the, the south. You're predominantly based in the southwest in terms of football yeah. clubs that you cover, it would seem as well. Yeah, so um, I live just outside of Bristol, so mainly sort of do. I mean, when I, when I finally got back to work for Soccer Saturday, they were brilliant, and I, I didn't really leave the southwest actually, um, apart from one. And it was it was at the end of August and it was that heat wave and I was on the QPR gantry and honestly that is the hottest gantry and I was pregnant. And my my poor cameraman when he went off to find me like a handheld fan he couldn't find one so I was just in the stress like literally I because I was pregnant I was literally dripping in sweat I was like oh my god like this is the worst gantry so yeah QPR went down in my my, my books for that but um obviously I'm in, in on gantries more than I am on, in press boxes now but um my favourite one you know what you're looking for is good cover from the elements to be honest in the winter so I do really like Swansea like that's a nice one because you're right by the press box I like the gantries that are by the press boxes because I can go and chat on half time and things um but obviously like, I love going to Ashton Gate because the pressure in there is amazing and, and you know I know pretty much know everyone that walks in which is so lovely and um, it's, it's the same in the southwest I'm lucky to know at least someone at every club um but I go to the Midland still and um don't really like going to Birmingham because it's a ladder and I don't I don't like heights, which is ridiculous <laughs> really. Um and then the London grounds are always a bit tricky because the traffic and the parking. So you're like, oh I've got to add that into account. So yeah, I just love I love being around here. I love going to you know, if I get Swansea Cardiff or Bristol City, I'm I'm happy. So I'm happy to go further afield, of course. Um, but it's just you get to know your clubs, don't you? You get to know people and, and you develop a relationship with them all and even though there's local rivalries, you do care about them all. So yeah, I like all of them. And have you got a favourite manager that you like to interview for the post match? Is there an interview that stands out in particular for you as well that's that's gone down as something quite memorable? Uh, Neil Warnock was always brilliant. I can't do it. Like I personally got on really well with him, which I think helps. You know, I don't think you want to get on the wrong side of him. Um, but he's always been amazing with me. And he was still at Cardiff when Zach was born. He he sent through like a video and things, which was which was lovely because. Because uh, that was a month early, I was meant to be interviewing him the day he was born, so um, that was quite, right. quite nice. Um, I, God, who do I enjoy? Ian Holloway, when he's managing, is always, always great value. And there's some managers you know, like, even if they've had a defeat, they're not going to be in a mood. They're very fair, like, um, Gary Monk is one of those, and Gary Rowett as well. But even if things haven't gone their way, they're not going to be annoyed at you for asking difficult questions, whereas some managers, you know, like, oh... How am I going to phrase it? Because I don't get annoyed. Um, so that can be a bit tricky. I'm trying to think of one that sticks out in my mind. What sticks out is constantly having to ask Lee Johnson a few years ago at Bristol City if he was going to lose his job <laughs> because oh. they've gone like eight, like a club record defeats in a row. And every week I had to come out and I felt sorry for him. I had to stick the microphone in his face and be like, you know, do you feel like you're still the back of the board? The fans have got banners out saying they want you out. Do you feel like you should still be doing this, is it the right thing to resign? And it's like, it's so difficult asking those questions week after week. And then finally he won, you're like, oh gosh, thank, thank goodness for that. And, you know, to be fair, they did the right thing sticking by him, by him didn't they? But um, yeah, I mean, I've done, when I've done sort of Premier League interviews, like Pep Guardiola sticks out after doing uh, Manchester City when they uh, beat Ash, uh, Bristol City at Ashton Gate in the League Cup. and how much he thought they were so great and how they were a Premier League 
to him already, things like that stick out. And there's controversial ones as well. Like I've done Neil Warnock many a time when he's been so annoyed at a referee and I'll, I'll be like, you know, what, what did you think of the referee? He's like, oh, you're trying to get me fined. I'm like, no, I'm not. And then like you put the microphone down and he's like, sorry, love, but I have to, I have to do that. He's like, oh, do you mind if I call you love? Like, am I allowed to call you love? Like, I'm like, really, that is fine. <laughs> so um, they're the sort of ones that stick out and I'll come off this call and I'll be like, oh, that's the one I should have told Toby about. Um, so I'm sure there are some, you know, after doing Aston Villa five, Nottingham Forest five, like both managers were just, like they were speechless. So that was, um, that was such a crazy game. They were like, I don't understand how we scored five goals and not won, you know, so things like that. And, and getting to interview people you watched as a kid, like Frank Lampard and things, that's quite surreal. So yeah, it's, um, when you get moments like that, you're like, well, I watched Frank Lampard like playing for England in the World Cups and here I am interviewing him. So, but I haven't, yeah. I haven't done David Beckham yet. Yeah. That's the one I want. That is, yeah, well, if you get that, that that's career made then, isn't it? You get to know what goes on behind the scenes as well. And you're almost, I, I'd imagine your producer wants you to ask certain questions as well. The fans don't always see that side of things. It's hard to be, to have to, you know, go into the press room after, a, you know, a game where, I don't know, they've been really unlucky. They've hammered the other team, but they've, you know, not come away with the result. And then actually go and put those questions to each of the managers. Yeah, but it's still a job. So, like, as much as I have, like, an affinity with, you know, well, when Steve Cooper at Swansea, who was at Swansea before Steve Cooper? This is terrible. I'm so sorry. Like, this is, I had, I had four hours sleep last night, just saying. Well, I see, I don't know. So, there you go. I, I don't have that excuse. Oh, uh, well, Carlos, uh, Carlos Carver was there for a while. And, you know, I got on um, brilliantly with him, but I had to ask him horrible questions because they're about to get relegated, you know. And, I, what, what I find, what I do find like tricky is because I get on Bristol City so much, is like when they're not doing very well, like I have to ask Lee Johnson and Dean Holden and Damien McCallis for difficult questions. But then you put the mic down and you'll chat with them and it is fine most of the time. Most of the time they know it's not, it's not personal, you know, they know, I hope they know I'm just, just doing my job really, but then I might find it hard if someone stuck the, the microphone in my face and said like, you know, you've lost five in a row, do you feel under pressure? Well, of course they feel under pressure. But they usually have to, a diplomatic answer. And that, to be fair, the majority of managers are really good at dealing with it. Um, when they start not getting it, good at dealing with it, you know that things may be a slip in a little bit. Now, you obviously cover a, a great deal of championship football. We've seen um, how home advantage has seemingly gone out the window in the German leagues now that they're back playing. Do you have predictions how you see the remainder of the championship season when we are back playing? It looks as though it's going to be a week maybe after the Premier League begins. Honestly, I can tell you what's going to happen. Like, it, <laughs> it's, uh, it doesn't feel like the same season. Like, I do feel like it's right to finish it. I, the problem was player contracts because they're obviously June the 30th. You know, a lot of players' contracts expire and they'll want to move, understandably so, but I'm not convinced everything will get, get done by June the 30th. I think all it takes is, is it Dynamo Dresden in, in Germany? The whole squad had to self-isolate. I'm not quite sure what's happening with that over here because players are testing positive. But I assume because they've been distance training in the Premier League that the whole team isn't having to self-isolate because they've been two metres apart. When they start contact, I don't know how that's, that's going to work because you're, you're getting... I would say it's reassuring the positive test. It's not a huge amount, you know, it's a couple in, in a thousand, but it's still a couple. And we've seen that everything has a snowball effect with, with this virus. So I'm not completely convinced that it's going to be smooth sailing. You know, there's definitely going to be hiccups along the way. I think it's probably, I can't say for sure it's the right thing to get it back on, but I do think it will help people like at home watching football um, because it's something to do, you know, and everyone loves football. I watched the Bundesliga the first weekend and it wasn't because of the crowd I couldn't get into it. It's because I don't know what's happening in the Bundesliga. Like, it doesn't mean anything to me. Whereas when the Premier League starts back up, <laughs> there is a danger, I think, when Liverpool win it. Like, that end of the tail, we'd be like, oh yeah, whatever. But the relegation battle is fascinating. As for the Championship, you know, you look at teams like, I know I've mentioned them a lot because I cover them, but Bristol City. They've got players back now. They've got Benneke Fogi back, who's such an amazing striker, and they've got players fit, and they've got this whole depth to choose from. And a lot of squads you'd think would have that, but as soon as one 
might get unwell and you could be losing key players. So I think so much of who gets promoted from a championship depends on the health of their squad now. Because you could easily be missing a key player and there will be muscular injuries. When they're playing this many games in a row, there'll definitely be injuries, at least a few. So I think it's whichever team gets some luck and it's momentum, isn't it? With just a handful of so of games left. Is it nine games left? Um, yeah. Yeah. If you can put a run together, a team that's ninth or tenth at the moment could steal the team that's in fourth. So they don't even write off like Cardiff City yet. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's very true. And I mean, I guess given the what's at stake with these remaining games uh if you know if this situation has arisen at the start of the season we were watching games behind closed doors it wouldn't have quite felt the same but now that there's so much on the line it's still going to make it you know interesting for the audiences it'll be a brilliant morale boost for the country as well if i had to push you for a for a top six i mean we've got leeds west brom fulham brentford forest preston if I had to push you, those two at the top will, will remain at the top. And then beyond that, who do you think might get promoted? I'm just going to have a little look at the table quickly because it feels like forever since I looked at it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you've got to look at Leeds and West Brom and think, oh, God, they'd have to have a really big change in momentum to, to not make it. I, th I just think it's impossible to say because I would even say as far, so I would say as far down as Derby, down 51. Maybe even QPR and 50. Any of the top top 13 could nab one of those spots. I think Fulham, Fulham will make it. But below Fulham, what's that? Nine teams? Any of those nine teams? Sorry for the vague answer. But I think Leeds and West Brom will go up. Um, it's so hard. I think Bristol City might sneak in, but we'll see. But I'll have, what will they do with the playoffs? You know, how's that going to work? Like, will they only just do one leg? Then have to see how the, will the games play out. Um, it's just so weird. It's so weird to play domestic football in summer, you know? It's, I mean, the world's weird, isn't it? But <laughs> it's like we've never known it like it. Nothing is a surprise anymore. That's the thing. And even there's even talk of the FA Cup being completed as well. I thought they'd have done away with all of the cup competitions, but it would seem you know as though I, we're going to have FA Cup football. I think I, I was surprised when I saw that. I think they're going to do the quarterfinals in July and they want to do the final on August the 1st, but I'm like, well, if, you, if you're if you in such a rush to get the Premier League and the Championship finished, surely you should be looking to start the new season a couple of weeks after that. So now I feel like the FA Cup is like the charity shield, <laughs> like at the start of August, it's just going to feel super weird. Um, but I don't think there'll be much of a break between seasons, if, if everything's successful, you know. But they're not going to have crowds back till, I don't think they have crowds back till the start of next year, unless they can find some way of spacing everyone so diligently and people not touching things you know it's it's impossible like personally everyone's got their own personal opinions on, on what's right and what's not right now but you know we've been super careful we haven't you know i've seen in the last week i've started seeing people from you know like mum friends from two three meters away in the park but you know our family's miles away anyway so we're not really seeing anyone so if i was I don't know what's going to happen, but if I was to go back to work, I I feel safe in the sense that I'm up in the gantry away from things. Um, and I'd be comfortable doing an interview with someone like with a stick mic, I think, as well. So I would personally feel quite comfortable because my job's like that. But it's different what you're asking for players, you know. And I think they have every right to say, oh, actually, I'm not comfortable with this, like Troy Deeney did. Um, I'm not, I don't think anyone in the Championship has done that yet that I've read about. Um, no, but yeah. And and of, of people being tested in the championship as well, there's been very little actual positive tests. So it's all gone smoothly, but it will be interesting, particularly if, you know, there is a bit of a second, well, second peak and, you know, a few more players end up getting tested positive, how things will unfold at that point. It's, it's so diff You can't predict anything, you know, two or three days ahead at the moment. It's impossible. I mean, yeah, look at like the last week, everything that's happened is absolutely, like if you'd written 2020 down, people would have thought like, you are absolutely crazy. <laughs> you know, the, yeah, you can't make it up. I, everything's everything's been flipped up upside down. There's not one person I don't think this, this is not affected. So I'm, I'm pleased for the footballers that want to be back. I think there's, it's quite serious. There's been a lot of young men that live on their own, living in flats without a garden that have this lifestyle they're used to with being around 20, 30, young men their age 
every day and going to being so isolated that must have been quite quite difficult to cope with I'm, I'm sure that people will say you know well, well they've got millions of pounds they're living in a luxury flat or whatever but they're still people at the end of the day and no doubt a lot of people had it way harder and take nothing away you know from all the key workers and things but just putting that you know in a different box just talking about footballers we can't forget that it would have taken a, a mental toll on them as well and the physical thing is now they've got to get back up to fitness so We'll see, we'll see if they're like me after lockdown, if they've been eating all the ice creams or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly have, so I'm with you there. So what, just, just to end on, what is next for you? You mentioned, you, you know, you're very ambitious and you want your career to continue, you know, on the upwards. You're looking forward to the Euro, Euros next summer as well. What is your kind of goal in, say, two to three years' time? Not to look this tired. <laughs> you don't look it's, tired it's, at all. <laughs> God, it's just at least the glasses. Huh? I have to wear glasses. This is I have to wear glasses now when I'm reading and on the computer. This is what Saka has done to me. No time oh, to wear God. glasses. Do you know what? Like I know, like what I said at the start, and, and how you know I'm, I am always for the next thing. Like I definitely feel if I'd been back by now, like I wouldn't have been doing that. Like I would have been enjoying work and enjoying my time at home, because being so so lucky to become a parent has completely changed my view on things. But that's not to say like I don't want to. See, see what's on offer or what I could work towards, but I don't really know what that is at the moment because I'm very, very happy. You know, our plan was to do Soccer Saturday and Soccer Special and do my podcast and my writing that I do, which would sort of take two and a half days a week and well, and we'd swap sort of childcare. That was the plan. And we weren't really looking beyond that for a couple of years, um, but obviously had this great opportunity with the Euros. So I was going to take that and, and see where that led or if that was just what it was, then then take that experience and and use that towards something else. So at the moment, I just want to get back to it. Like I feel, I don't, I, I think everyone feels the same, but when you're away from something, when you've been away, as I have been away longer because of Zach, you're just like, you want to prove you can still do it. So I'll do that first and we'll go from there. I think as well, uh, you it's nice to have a bit of time to sit back and reflect on what you are doing and what you have achieved so far people get very caught up in achieving the next thing in a long list yeah. of what you know what they want to do and they don't actually realize what they're doing at the moment is brilliant and perfectly fine for the stage they're at in their lives yeah exactly and i'm and you know we talked about it, like okay like if if this is you know everything that i'm, I'm gonna do like it's fantastic and i'd be more than happy if my whole career was carrying on doing Soccer Saturday and Soccer Special, long may it continue, and hopefully Sky will still want me. And if I get a chance to go and do this tournament and that goes well, well, maybe I could look towards doing another tournament, but I'm not really thinking beyond that at the moment. I think up until when I had Zach, I was always like, okay, what's next? What's next? What's next? But there comes a time when you need to be like, well, I'm so lucky with everything I, I have. And, you know, now we've got even more responsibility and people are going through really hard times you know we're paying mortgages and paying bills you just have to feel feel lucky but i do need to get back to work to pay those bills as well so it, this whole virus has put things like that in perspective too well thank you very much for your time we'll let you go and enjoy this I mean, i'm sweltering in my front room at the moment so we'll let you go and enjoy your uh, your weekend son uh, and we look forward to seeing you back on sky sports news very soon and can't wait to see you at the euros next summer as well it's very very exciting Thanks, Toby. Hopefully, hopefully we both back down after the date rating.